won't Google anything else. But but uh, but really glad to be uh, here with you. And certainly here we got 45 days left uh, as we're going into year end. So hopefully this will give you some ideas. As Jen mentioned, we got 10 different trends. Some of these are shorter term, uh, but I think very important trends. And some of these are sort of mega uh, longer term trends. I'll sort of call those out as I go through as well. And one thing I wasn't going to mention this, and I was certainly not paid to say this, but um, I was actually the, the vice president of advancement at the Community Foundation Atlanta, sort of Stacey's position, long, long ago. And you may be uh, surprised, perhaps, to hear that for six years I was there, we only, only um, did marketing to professional advisors so that when their clients were planning something or selling something to the extent that they needed a charitable solution or partner, that we uh, perhaps were positioned to do that. And if we weren't, we'd certainly let them know that as well. So 90% of all of our donors came to us as uh, referrals from their professional advisors. And the other 10% of donors came to us uh, as referrals from existing donors who had originally come to us from their professional advisors. So when I say literally nothing else uh, for six years, it was only that relationship that Jen, Stacy, and team uh, have with you. And there is nothing that helps a community foundation grow faster then its relationship uh, with those advisors, obviously for a lifetime or te testamentary gifts. So I was at the Akron Community Foundation last week, Cincinnati Community Foundation last week, and Indianapolis Community Foundation last week, and it was the same uh, theme and trend for all of those places. So that actually is a trend I was going to sort of talk about from a uh, from a context standpoint. So these are the top 10 trends. Uh, we'll sort of just jump right in. Any questions you have, if you can maybe just put that in the in the chat or the, the Q&A, probably chat. And maybe Jen, I'm super informal, so you just interrupt me, and I'll I'll sort of stop and sort of take these as we go. So with that, I'll I'll jump right in. So this one I think is very very important, um, and I say this with love because I'm saying it to myself as well. But for professional advisors to realize that philanthropy is alive and well, kind of no matter what, and the no matter what is tax stuff. So I get very excited about tax stuff. You guys are probably geeks too, saying this with love. You get excited about tax stuff. Uh, your clients don't care. And you all sort of know that intuitively, but they really, really don't care. And so a couple things. One, you can see they're giving peaked in this country, first peak, 2006, uh, 2007, before the big 2008, 2009 downdraft. And in the low point of the Great Recession, giving was down 5%. So 95 cents on every dollar coming in. And the biggest giving year in the history at that point in time, still coming in at the low point of the Great Recession. I want to be very clear about this. This is a crazy trend, and you all know it, but I want to verbalize it and make it very clear. And that is we as a culture, as a people, are incredibly generous. You all know that. What most people don't realize is how irrationally, wonderfully, but irrationally generous we are. So many times when I talk with advisors, they would say something like, oh, I know Americans give more per capita than anybody else. We're kind of like the UK. We're kind of like Canada. We're kind of like Australia. They're two, three, and four globally. We give double what they give, double. Here's where it gets weirder. 2020, things happened, you might recall. There were, I would suggest, maybe 30 or 40 really, really good reasons not to make a charitable gift in 2020, like real reasons. I don't know if I'm going to be alive. I don't know if people in my family are going to be alive. I don't know if I'm going to have a job. But you know what? I'm going to give more than I've ever given before. Giving in this country rose by more in 2020, right into the meat and heart of the pandemic than it has ever grown in the history of recorded giving data, ever. Does that make any sense? No, and it's fantastic. I'll add on another fun layer. Another fun layer is I read all the tax reports, you read all the tax reports, Deloitte, PwC, all these reports, oh my gosh. Soon as standard deductions double, that means that the relatively few people that were otherwise itemizing, that's gonna go down to 10%. One out of 10 people in this country itemize. Therefore, all the forecasts, charitable giving is going to go way down because there's no tax incentive to make a gift for 90% of the population. 
And if you read that report and you look at all the data, at the end, you would say, makes sense to me. And then 2020 comes along, let's just throw a pandemic into the mix. How bad could that be? Oh yeah, and then let's double the standard deduction. Oh yeah, let's have the biggest giving year in the history of the country. The second biggest giving growth year in the history of the country, 2021, can't make it up. Which gets back to that second bullet point. If conspicuous consumption is the only competitor, many people would say that's the only thing that's competing with charitable giving or philanthropy. Are you okay? What's that mean? Kids okay? Pad that whole other slide. The question that becomes is to the extent that you have excess or you're blessed to have any kind of surplus over those two poor needs. The question is, what do you do? And what was, what was the depression era estate plan for all depression era? It was one sentence. Everything I have, two kids. That was the estate plan. And more and more, the baby boomers, that shifted a lot. Now it's, they're okay, kids okay. And now do they buy the bigger steak or bigger house or bigger car or vacation? They can do whatever they want to with it. But more and more are reallocating those material, type, not everybody, but material type distributions or discretionary um, expenses over to philanthropy, either during life and or at death. So that's what we're seeing more and more of. Now, what do donors love to give to you? What are the big four? Big four, always kids, pets, schools, churches. Ooh, big four sexy ones, kids, pets, schools, churches. So if you've got a client and you're part of a, a board, perhaps, or you're advising a charity, little suggestion here, you want them to do a special event. Usually special events are horrible, by the way, but they could do a special event and then get the little girl on the, on the mini pony through the church school. If you just jam the little girl on the mini pony, she's like trotting through, that's your special event, cash. You need a lot of cash. Those are the big four sexy things. What we have seen very uh, specifically too are for those big sexy things in sort of bubbly times, get a lot of donations. But certainly in the Great Recession, and we saw it at the extreme in wonderful ways during the pandemic, that people are very nimble and then they go much more to, they see core need, basic need, they respond very quickly. So to sort of shift what those typical giving patterns are to whatever the, the, the critical needs are. And to be real blunt, that's what ECCF does every single day from its perch with $130 million and 250 plus funds is they're able to see within the, the specific community and the regions what A, the critical needs are, but B, what organizations or programs have the most impact around those needs. So they can sort of be their, their local Sherpa uh, advisor to those donors and to you as professional advisors too. Next slide is still on number one. So philanthropy alive well, sort of no matter what. I find this interesting. So I went back to 1956, looked at overall charitable giving relative to GDP. And so you get GDP over overall charitable giving and you basically plot it as a percentage. And you can see here, I went back to 1956, but this is where I started it because it was most interesting to me. 1971, so it was 2.1% overall charitable giving relative to GDP drops to 1.7%. Anybody know what the 70% little red line here is? The highest marginal income tax bracket. Oh my God. So you got two schools of economic thought. One would say giving should go up like crazy because that creates a hyper subsidy. If you give a dollar and you deduct that at 70 cents, it costs you 30 cents to make that gift at that highest marginal rate. So hyper, hyper subsidy, basically like a, a triple match, if you will. The other school of economic thought says, no, 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 Brian, you don't understand. Taxes are so large that they will crowd out all discretionary giving and when that's, uh, or expenses. When that's crowded out, you feel poor. And when you feel poor, you're not going to make a charitable gift. And if you listen to both of those uh, economists speak, you just say, yeah, that kind of makes sense. They both kind of make sense. That's weird. So you've got 1.7 to 2% roughly. We jump here. This is not theoretical. These aren't economic models. This is reality. The Reagan Tax Act, 1986 to 1993, 28 to 30%. Two schools of economic thought. You remember what they were. Wiggle, 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 wiggle. 1.7 to 1.9%. In fact, in 1956, it bounced between 1.9 and 2.2% every single year. Super high taxes, super low taxes, uh, $200,000 estate exemption equivalent, $600,000, $3.5 million, no estate taxes, complete repeal. Then they come back, 
Throw a war into the mix. Throw stagflation into the mix. Throw inflation into the mix. 1.9, 2.2%. It is weird how consistent that is over time. So I say this with love to all you advisors. You are focused on taxes. I'm focused on taxes. Nobody else is focused on taxes. They see need they're going to give. And they're coming to you to say, help me do that in a more tax-wise way so that maybe I can give more than I otherwise thought possible, that I can redirect tax dollars, state and federal, to my ECCF fund that I can then give away and have more fun. Not saying taxes are immaterial, but that's the frosting, the gravy, the cherry on top. That's not the meat. And so people see need, they're going to respond. In many cases, irrationally, which is wonderful. That's where the first one right out of the gate. Second, demographic trends, best friend, worst enemy. So I live in Florida. I can attest to bullet point number one times 10. The cohort of 85 and over, the fastest growing uh, cohort in population in the country. They're all driving. They keep driving everywhere in Florida. Women are controlling. I can lose half my audience right here. So I got everybody simmer down, simmer down. So my daughter loves that shirt. And it says, let's eat, comma, grandma. And then the other part says, let's eat, no comma, grandma. Those mean very different things. So women are controlling or will control an unprecedented level of wealth. This is a big, big deal, big trend. So I'm an actuary, at least academically by background. You have to go through calculus three, not a joke, to mathematically determine that women kill us all off. 72% of the time, the surviving spouse is a female. That's the math. I can run it for you if you'd like. And they give very differently, much more in particular for community foundations, unrestricted funds, discretionary field of interest funds. Men, we love to restrict. We get very excited about restrictions, restricting life, put the restrictions on the restrictions, restricted death. Oh, we go crazy with restrictions. Doesn't matter because 28% of the time we're the widower, 72% of the time there's the widow. So 72% of the time, spotting spouse is a female, very different giving patterns. Next, big, big trends relative to demographic and generational shifts. Weird to verbalize, but one first thing you learn as an actuarial student is there's a 100% mortality rate in this country. Sorry to tell you that. I don't know about other countries. 100% mortality. And this is, to be very clear, depression era, we literally have about three years left of the entire depression era, there will be none left. Weird to verbalize. So our entire greatest generation, three years, that's it. Next up, boomers. Depression era, how did they give? My grandfather was in Rotary, knew some people in the United Way Allocations Committee who are Rotarians with him. I trust Joe, I give my payroll deduction to Joe. They'll figure it out, I trust Joe. Generation X, Y, millennials, my niece, niece is a little wacky. She's in sorority. She goes to Haiti for a trip. They realize all this is true, realize like 24, 48 hours in that there's a um, particular community that needs a well. So she puts on uh, with all of her sorority sisters, creates the GoFundMe page, creates the Instagram account with Facebook, sends it out to the whole network for all of them. They raise about $4,600 in 48 hours. They say they dug the well. I don't think it was pumping water, but they dig, dig a big hole. And then they took a bunch of pictures, of course, and then they sort of flew back. That's her way of giving. That is totally different. It is not possible to fully appreciate how freaked out the large blue chip traditional charities are. United Way, American Red Cross, all these big, big groups, Cancer Society, those groups to Generation XY, that's anathema to them. That is, that is not what they typically give to, much more obviously relational in various ways and very much grassroots, completely different than what certain depression era gave to. So if you're a large traditional blue chip historic charity and you had your one big foot on a really big lily pad that was the depression era that pad is gone in 36 months and you're we using your other foot going where's the next lily pad where's the next lily pad it, it, it's not possible to understand how stressful that is for many in that particular lane so 
Next, after this one, I'll sort of pause if any sort of questions pop up. Um, so competition everywhere. 125 to 150 new charities created every single day of the year, including weekends and holidays. But yeah, weekends and holidays. So what does that mean if you multiply? I think somebody keeps switching this. I don't think it's mine. Could be. Um, so if you take the 125 times the 365 days in a year, it's about 35 to 50 thousand new charities created every year. It gets crazier. In 2008 and 9, many of you might remember the Great Purge. And so that's where you had charities that had not filed their 990 in three years were removed as public charities off the cumulative list publication 78 from the IRS. And many of us said, okay, you know, now we have at least a better idea about how many charities exist versus sort of the file drawer, drawer charities that hadn't operated for 5, 10, 20 years. Who knows? That dropped down to about 960,000, went from 1.3 million down to about 950, 960,000. There are over 1.5 million now, as I can't even keep up. It's another 100,000, obviously, every two years. So it's like 1.48 million is the current number. It's crazy. So I just so encourage you as advisors, nobody will do this. But if you have a client that said, hey, I'd like to create a literacy program Please have them sit down for 10 minutes, not 11. Just give me 10 minutes and Google and type what it is that you, they wish to do. And then sometimes a B solution is the best solution. So I'd like to teach kids how to read on Tuesday at four. Well, do you know that Susie has her own nonprofit and she's teaching kids how to read on Thursday at you know 3.30? Can't learn how to read on Thursday. Yeah, you can. Go talk to Susie help her teach kids how to read. Don't create a whole separate nonprofit because of the massive redundancy. And it's not so much just the mission redundancy, that's 1.48 million boards, 990s, back office. You're just talking about massive inefficiencies. And so, so many people get excited about an idea and I usually say of the 1.48 million other ones out there, maybe it's not an A plus match, A minus, B, B minus, that's good. You want to work with at-risk kids? Just call Boys and Girls Club. Just go down there for 10 minutes. Oh, no, no, I want to create my own thing. So it's just, it's crazy how many additional nonprofits, unfortunately, being created. You can see here, two sort of uh, trends within the charitable uh, planning space on the professional advisor side. So now there's a lot of disintermediation that's occurring. So as Jen mentioned, you know, they could do a donor advised fund, charitable remainder trust, do all kinds of things within products within these institutions that otherwise were going through charities directly. So about two thirds of all charitable plans are created and executed at the advisor level. Believe it or not, 20 year, years ago, it was the opposite, the inverse. About one third was created at the advisor level two-thirds were created at the charities level in terms of the design of the plan, what it was going to do, and then it went back to advisors. Now charities aren't even part of that conversation. It's creating some huge issues, gigantic issues. So one as an example is the only thing worse than the charity not getting a donation is getting a gift in particular through estates that they're not able to actually administer. So it just sort of comes in out of the blue because I say with love again, advisors are like, oh, I don't want to breach the confidentiality. I want to make sure that, you know, I'm working with my client. I get it. I get it. But then the poor charity is receiving these gifts with all these usual restrictions, which are creating mission whip. And especially if it's got a lot of digits on it. My bad joke is if it's an after school program that's a 501c3 and some woman goes down to Florida and sees a bunch of porpoises, porpi, porpi, they want to create one at the after school program, and it's $8 million, that poor group's going to say, well, how many porpoises do we have to put in the stupid pond to get that big gift? So this is happening a lot more than people think, because more and more of these gifts are occurring with the advisors and never having any communication at all with the charities. Community foundations are a great spot for that because they can maintain that confidence, and they're not biased generally toward one charity or the other. They can help any charities within their region or beyond, so it can be sort of a safer place. But it is, it's rampant, I would say epidemic right now, that I'm getting calls from charities saying, you know, we got this great gift, and I guess that's good, but 
I mean, the restrictions they have, we can't do this, and this isn't part of our plan, and we're not funded for this area, we don't have the administration, it's creating a, a real challenge. So just be careful, and I would say, again, ideally, to still speak with the charity about what it is that, that the donor is trying to accomplish, and can the charity do it? Many of these gifts are endowments. How long do endowments last? Perpetuity, fun word would say, perpetuity. I say with love again, you have no clue what the word perpetuity means. Perpetuity means literally until no member of our species continues to inhabit the earth. That's what perpetuity means. So these charities are receiving these gifts that now until the end of time as we know it, they are supposed to manage all these restrictions for that specific purpose. But yet they never had a a uh, heads up that it was coming in, or perhaps other ways of being able to design it. So it's bringing lots of issues. There is a Methodist church in Macon, Georgia, not making this up, overall balance sheets, $15.1 million, $15.1 million overall balance sheet, Methodist church, Macon, Georgia, $12.2 million flower fund. That's not a joke. They are legally required based on their spending policy, which they dropped down to 4%, to spend $480,000 a year on flowers because that is the restriction. They're going through variance power, Cypre, trying to break that at the state level. That's not a five minute, $5 process, by the way. And what I found interesting was they actually received this gift by bequest in 1961. It was $72,000. And from 1961, until 2022, it's grown to $12.2 million. From 1961 to 2022, that is a speck of sand in the period of time. But they had no way of being able to break those restrictions. And the church even told me, she said, at least they would have given us beautification. We could literally fix the holes in the ceiling that we can't fix, but we have to spend $40,000 a month on flowers. I mean, it becomes nonsensical. I made, and I shouldn't tell you this, but I will, I made the little snarky consultant comment. I'm like, well, isn't it kind of good to have the hole in the ceiling because you got the flowers? And they, didn't, they didn't think that was funny at all. But <laughs> I'm like, shut up. But I digress. You get the point. A lot more of this is occurring because advisors are not talking with the charities, don't have to disclose anything, but just say, you're going to manage this forever. Are there some other things that we might be able to build into this plan to still maintain donor interest and impact? but that you can actually administer. So I just am strongly encouraging those kinds of conversations. And the final piece here are development plans almost exclusively focusing on the big ones. So it used to be the old 80-20 rule. And the 80-20 rule, of course, was 80% of these big campaigns coming in from 20% of the donors. Then about actually right after 2008-2009 um, recession, it quickly went to 90-10. This was about three years prior to the pandemic. A group came up and they said 6% of our donors made 90% of the gifts. And about three months prior to the pandemic, I had somebody come up. This was a billion four, I think, uh, billion four campaign uh, university, Midwest. And they came up and they said, we just had slightly less than 4% of our donors giving 90% of the campaign. So when I talk with advisors, I hear a lot. They're saying, God, it feels like my biggest clients are getting hit up a lot more. They are. Also, why many will choose a community foundation to try to get off of that radar, get rid of some of these additional uh, requests, be able to give anonymously and some of these other reasons. But if you think that you've seen sort of wealth profiling and research, you have never been into a campaign war room. They know everything about everybody. It's spooky. So much so. So much so that some major gift officers, I kid you not, this is a verbatim quote, said, I'm not allowed to go out the door unless I can make a request of an ask of at least $250,000. Because it's inefficient, because we have over 600 people that we have a profile that should have that level of capacity. And what most of my nonprofit Friends are saying, I wonder what's going to happen the next campaign because you're only engaging 5 to 8% maybe of your whole population. And what I'm hearing over and over and over again, in particular from senior fundraising management is, 
the next president suggests that the next president worry about the next campaign. Because we're trying to raise as much money as possible as quickly as possible. And it's easier getting a $1 million check than 10 $100,000 checks. So we're going to do that. Totally changed in the last 10, 15 years, completely. So again, your clients are probably getting hit up a little bit more. I haven't seen any other things and I can't see what that chat is. So Jenna, you just let me know if any questions come in, but yeah, no, we're good. Kind of we're good for now. Here. Okay, good. So this is a big one, big, big, big. So in our uh, space and research around charitable planning, Dr. Russell James is sort of our Michael Jordan uh, in our space. He's a professor out of Texas Tech and he did a very large study. This is one slide from that study, which I thought was so impactful. And you can see there's sort of simplifying language and asking the right question at the right time. And so I would encourage you, we're talking about charitable planning clearly, but however simple you think your language is, make it simpler. It is just a constant reminder to me how what I think is very clear, other humans evidently do not. So this was a focus group. Everybody says they're going to do some focus group. They never do anything in a focus group, but this sort of gives you a sense around language. So you can see here at 1,246 people as part of this focus group, but a big chunk. And he asked the first uh, focus group, broke up into two groups, how many of you would like to make a gift to charity in your will? Just simply ask that one question. 23% of those people said they'd be interested in doing that now. They're not, but in their heads, they were interested in doing that now. He then asked the other focus group, how many of you would like to make a bequest gift to charity? Half as many people were interested. And I know what everybody on this webinar right now is thinking, I think you're thinking this, you're thinking it's the same thing. A gift through a will is the same as a bequest. It is the same thing, except to normal humans. Bequest, is this like the third century? Are knights going to be going across my lawn? Am I like a, in a you know, surf? I don't know what that is. And a bequeath, I don't even know how to spell it. You got to add like three more vowels in there. Oh my gosh, I don't know what any of that means. Gift through my will? Yeah, I could do that. I understand what that is. That's a gift through a will. One word that means exactly the same thing has twice as many people interested in doing that thing. Can't make that up. Bequest is kryptonite to plan gifts. And again, think about overall estate planning or overall financial planning words or language that you might be using that for me is like bequest I'm, that's very straightforward but that is not straightforward so what is it more simply it's a gift through will then that's something they can actually lock into can't make that up gets crazier the next group is this is a uk study this was actually released a year prior to dr james but they had seen some of his preliminary research and in the uk you can actually have your will done on the phone you call on the phone, they ask you all the fact finder questions that you go through as well as part of an estate plan. They take payment somehow, I have no idea. This is not a focus group. This is the first 1,000 callers as an experiment. I love this experiment. First 1,000 callers, they never uh, discussed or mentioned charity at all. 5% of those callers said, you never mentioned charity. I'd like to include that in my will. And I said, sure. What would you like to give? How much would you like to give? And so they included that. The next group of 1,000, they asked one question. Would you like to leave any money to charity in your will? They were going to say bequest. Dr. James said, no, do not say bequest. That's going to kill it. Say in your will. That one question as part of the fact finder questionnaire 10%, you can see, included charity in their will. Fine. Then we humans are unbelievably manipulable. It, it's, we are puppets on a string. Like, oh, not me. All of us. It's kind of scary, too. And so in our heads, this is true. We have this reptilian part of our brain. We want to be part of a herd. We think if we're part of a herd, we're not going to get eaten by something. This is all true. So in behavioral finance, behavioral economics, that's, that's called social norming. What's the social norm? What's the herd? So you can see they did it very elegantly through their way that they asked the question. They don't even call them clients in the UK. Many of our customers like to leave money to charity in their will. 
boom, herd. Many people are doing this over here, and it's so warm and cozy in the herd. If you want to stay out of the herd and get eaten, your call. But if you want to come over into the herd, all we have is one extra question. Are there any causes that you're passionate about? I want to be in the herd. Yes, there are causes, uh, causes that I'm passionate about. 15% of actual people doing actual wills included a charitable provision. It gets crazier. The researchers then went back and looked at the average amount from this group and the average amount in that group because they have the wills, they have all the data. It was exactly the same average, it's like 10 pounds different, super close. This group left double the amount of the first two. I want to be real clear. By not asking a question at all versus asking the right question in the right way at the right time, and you should know this, Maybe the community budget would say many of our donors like to leave money to us in their will, et cetera. And you would say many of our clients. So you just add that one thing. And I'd make it a run-on sentence, just put a comma there after will. That's what I would do. Asking one sentence differently, three times more people were doing it at twice the dollar amount. Six times more going to charity. That's called a 6X. Six times more going to charity based on this one question. So whenever I have clients or, I'm sorry, advisors say, oh, what are there questions that are important to ask? Or what questions kind of like it? It's not kind of like it. It's this. This is the academically tested question. Many of our clients like to leave money to charity in their will. Are there any causes that you are passionate about? That's it. That is the tested question. The other thing I'll give you, which is the best line I've ever heard in my entire life, was in Salina, Kansas. You'll never hear another human say that exact sentence as long as you live, by the way. Salina, Kansas. And a state attorney, real tall guy, stood up. It was at a Legacy Society dinner for a community foundation. And he said, you know what my job is as an estate attorney? It's to build up your trust enough so that you'll invite me into your garden. And when I'm in your garden, I need your help picking out your favorite annuals. The second I know what your favorite annuals are, I turn those into perennials. That's what I do. That is the best line I've ever heard in my entire life. And so what they're probing here is what are their annuals? What are the causes today that you're passionate about and that you would want to have continue forever, where you want to have the most impact? What are your annuals? We can help turn those into perhaps in partnership with our community foundation into perennials. So just sort of give that, give that point. Okay. So main thing is simplifying language and then also sort of understanding what the right question, right way, right time to ask using sort of the social norming behavioral finance um, component. So, okay. Next one, I've been hearing about this a lot. So giving pledge. Uh, so actually came out yesterday, today, I guess. So Jeff Bezos is uh, saying he's going to give away his $124 billion. He is not signing the giving pledge, which is kind of peculiar, uh, but sort of ending up in the same spot. So giving pledges, I think you all know, is a billionaire component where there may be 190, 195, it's kind of moving around slightly, of worldwide billionaires pledging to give at least half of their wealth away during life or at death, Bill Gates and and Warren Buffett sort of came up with this. A huge myth takeaway is that this is happening with the billionaires next door. This is really happening with the millionaires next door in a gigantic way. So as I mentioned before, so on the estate side, depression era, everything I have to kids. Baby boomers, the last US trust study that I saw, it's a longitudinal study every three years for high net worth inheritance goals for kids is ninth, like one less than eighth, completely different. And much of this is around, you've heard the Warren Buffett quote, I'm sure you've heard it a thousand times, you should give your kids so much that they can do anything, but not so much that they can do nothing. You say that to a welding contractor, that resonates. Millionaires next door, Give the every edge, don't take the edge away. Transfer the values, not just the valuables. You, you've heard all of these things. Stephen Pickens, who we lost about a year and a half ago, said, 
you should never put your child in this situation where he or she doesn't have the pleasure of bringing home a paycheck. So as people are planning both their lifetime, what is that excess or surplus, they're considering this within that context for what is the right amount. And every family is different. But I listened to, this was very, very weird for me. So I was in Los Angeles. There's a speech uh, in Beverly Hills. I've been to Beverly Hills once in my life. I'll probably never go back. And there was a speech. Listen to this. This was her job. She was a child psychologist for high net worth families in Beverly Hills. If I'm ever convicted of murder, that should be my sentence is to deal with Beverly Hills family dysfunction all day long. Oh, my God. But she gave the speech, very good speech. And at the end of the speech, she said, are there any questions? I said, I've got a question. I said, I'm from a financial planning type background in every, tell me I'm wrong, every estate planning, tax planning, financial planning journal, somewhere in there will have an implicit or explicit article that would say, if you leave your kids too much money, you're going to ruin the kids. And I said, what has been your experience? I will never forget what she said. Never. She said, you tell me, get two kids. You tell me how each of those children get a $10 allowance on Friday. And you give me a little forensic accounting of that on Sunday. She said, I will tell you precisely how that nine-year-old, when he, she turns 55, will spend a $2.1 million inheritance. She said, I will not be off. That'll scare you. The daughter gets the $10 allowance. She whines to the mother to take her to the grocery store to get some sugar and get some women. She does a lemonade stand on Sunday and she's got $47. The $10 goes to the son. The son got eight IOUs already to the sister before he even gets the $10 allowance. And then the son, in her words, when the son is 52 and gets the million dollar inheritance and it's all gone in 36 months, she said the family is shocked shocked that that occurred. Really, you didn't see that coming at all <laughs> for 50 years. No idea. Her point was money personifies financial character. If they blow the 10 bucks, they're going to blow everything. I found that interesting. The other thing that was super scary was she said eight to 10. Eight to 10. She said by 10, that financial character is baked. She said it is BBs off a battleship after 10. She said, oh, people wait. Oh, in high school, we'll teach it. Oh, in college, we'll teach them that that's gone. It's gone, gone by then, eight to 10. I also found interesting, she said, the only thing that can possibly change that is a financial PTSD situation. A great recession or depression. Parents lose their jobs, foreclosure, bankruptcy. Something majorly traumatic has to occur usually teenage years, early 20s, to reboot the whole brain around financial stewardship. But, but for that, 8 to 10, that's it. So that'll scare you. You're welcome, by the way. So this is, again, where, and by the way, Warren Buffett, give your kids so much they can do anything, but not so much they can do nothing. We all, it's weird that it's not weird, say that five times fast, that we all know what his estate plan is, and we have for 25 years. He's giving 98% of his estate to charity, 2% to kids. Does anybody have their calculator out right now? Tell me, what, what's 2%? Only 2%, one more than 1%. 2% to kids, what's 2% of $120 billion? It's a lot. They're getting $2.4 billion. I could do nothing. I could, the Klotz household could do nothing if I got a $2.4 billion inheritance. I'd go down to basic cable and ramen noodles. I could make that work. But 98% going to charity. For the millionaires next door, are they giving 100%? No, but it might be 5%, 20%, 30%, much more than the depression era we're giving because they're figuring out and calibrating what's the right amount for each child. And then the spillover becomes that legacy gift. And in many cases, it's a spillover to a community foundation for a donor advised fund that the kids remain involved with, but the kids aren't getting a direct inheritance. They're getting an indirect inheritance through the family fund. So that's what we're saying more and more of. Now, quickly, what's the number one car driven by a millionaire in this country? Millionaire next door book, Ford F-150. Number one car driven by a millionaire. Interesting. Now, there are almost no estate taxes uh, returns are filed. Now, it's one-tenth of 1%. One but when they were filed, the 706 uh, estate tax return, anybody know the number one profession 
that filed an estate tax return, not by percentage, but overall number, it would say the profession of the decedent. And number one was teacher. Number one. Traditionally female, traditionally married to professional real estate, small business wealth. 72% of the time, she kills him. I love you, Will, comes over to her. Uh, not a lot of conspicuous consumption for most teachers, not driving BMWs of any series on the most campuses. So the point is then she has an estate tax problem. The average estate gift left to a charity is $50,000. The average annual donation to that same charity prior to leaving that $50,000 is $110 a year during life. Income, gift from income, $110 a year. Get from assets the fifty thousand through the estate. Why wouldn't she give more during life? She could live a long time. She could get sick. Her kids could get sick. Those things don't happen. Comes to the estate as the gift. So the point is, let's just make up a random county. If you're in Essex County, and you're walking down Main Street, whatever Main Street is, and you see a teacher in an F-150, and she's been given, let's say, the Community Foundation one hundred and ten dollars a year. You grab a hold, of, Jen, grab a hold of that bumper and she'll drag you. You know, you drag, 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 drag. She's got to stop at a stop sign, stop light, gas, whatever. You just hold on tight. And when you get to her house, if she's like dragging you up the driveway and you see these recycle bins and there are a whole bunch of kitty litter bags, gold mine. There's a direct linear relationship between the number of cats and the size of the estate gift. That's more true than not, by the way. So there's the cash again. So Little girl, mini pony, church school, and teacher, F-150, lots of cats. So those are sort of the three big buckets of, uh, of charitable giving. So there you go. So this one, wealth transfer. Wealth transfer is happening in a massive way. You know that. A little bit of the trick. I know you guys are up around Boston, so you may know sort of the Havens and Shervis, Boston Consulting Group, uh, whatever. Um, and I know this is being recorded, whatever again. So when they did this, it was 1998 to 2052. That was their forecast window. And so there's a bit of an academic trick. And the trick is if you're ever going to do a long range forecast, you want the end point of that forecast to be longer than anyone who will ever read it because it'll all be dead. You'll all be dead before 2052. So you can never be wrong. It's glorious. You do a really long tail on your forecast, never be wrong. And then you do longitudinal updates on a journal every five years with all the new data. That's what you do. The long story short here is this is happening in massive ways and in more ways now that the depression era has passed away almost completely, three more years left, that the baby boomers incidence of charitable estate plans is much, much higher than that from the depression era. So now we're at the cusp of the oldest baby boomers are now starting to pass away, creating most of these larger and larger gifts. So it's happening in a major, major trend way to very few charities, by the way. This one I'm talking about just for a couple seconds, and I'll move on to some of the other ones, but charitable gift annuities, most of you, um, I would say generally, are not very familiar with. For attorneys, for CPAs, for CFPs, if it's a paragraph in your overall credentialing education process, I'll be surprised. But there are more charitable gift annuities than charitable remainder annuity trusts, unit trusts, lead trusts, and pooled income funds combined. About 125,000 of these exist. And many of you might say, I have no idea. I've never seen one because they don't have to go through you. They go directly to the charity. I give the charity $100,000. Based on my age, I get a contractual, not a trust, contractual payment as long as I live or perhaps for me and my spouse. It's an installment sale contract. So a lot of the uh, basis tax-free comes back to me under on an installment sale basis. Long-term capital gain is pushed out. So in many cases, many cases, the uh, the effective after tax return from a gift annuity tends most always to be more than what it would be from a charitable remainder annuity trust. And a charitable remainder annuity trust can exhaust and they are exhausting everywhere. What does that mean? That means if you did a charitable remainder annuity trust in the late 90s, right before the downturn of the 2000, 2002 bear market, many of you know sequence of return risk. You cannot, not, 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 not take any kind of flat or negative return as you're making a fixed payout 
into that return. That creates negative compounding. Bad. The only thing that can save that is an early death. If not, it exhausts. What does that mean? It runs out of money and it stops. So more and more attorneys are saying, we're not going to do a turtle remainder annuity trust. We're going to do a one-page gift annuity. And some of these things are gigantic, big trend the last 10 years. Yale have, has one that's like $87 million on one person. We did one last year for S Corp that was $52 million on one person. Tons in the five to 15 million range because of the general creditor relationship it creates with the charity. The charity has to use all of its assets to back that, uh, that payment. So if it goes down to zero based on what was contributed, they have to keep making those payments. All that risk is a story for another day but more and more on the advisor side are looking at gift annuities, even for very large ones. When I first got into this business, it was only for very small ones. So it's totally changed last 10 or 15 years. So we got a couple trends here I um, wanna go through uh, under the not so recent tax act. So number one, don't touch cash. Cash, bad. Everything else, good. Cash, you know, is the smallest piece of the overall balance sheet. It hurts their lifestyle the most when they make a gift of cash, and it's the least tax-effective way to make a donation. So cash, not good. What's best? You can see here, non-cash, real estate, privately held stock, other weird assets, about four to six times that of the entire stock market. So highly appreciated publicly traded securities, good, but the same benefit. The same benefits if you have Amazon stock that's gone way up in value are exactly the same if you have privately held stock with very low basis. That's a long-term gain asset. Real estate, what do you do to real estate every single year for commercial and investment real estate? You depreciate it. What does it mean to depreciate it? You're lowering your adjusted tax basis every single year until such point in the time it is what? Zero. Zero basis long-term capital gain, 100% appreciation or close to it, that is a good gift to make. It is not possible to realize how rapidly this area is growing. I was doing a, a talk at the Wyoming Bar Association three weeks ago, couldn't plan this so much better, the day before I made this presentation on non-cash asset planning, the CEO of Patagonia gave away his whole business, the whole thing. $3 billion. In your neck of the woods, Dr. Bose went to MIT, liked MIT evidently, taught at MIT. 2012, I think it was, 2011, he gave 50.1% of the Bose Corporation to MIT. People thought, wow, that's kind of a neat gift. Yeah, $1.4 to $1.6 billion, closely held C Corp. These are happening everywhere in plain sight. So same thing, full fair market value deduction, no capital gains tax when sold, out of the estate for estate tax purposes, using the lowest cost basis, most highly appreciated long-term capital gain asset they have. That is the holy grail of charitable planning. And these are the assets that have the lowest basis. What is the C-Corp basis, an S-Corp, an LLC, for everyone with an 800-mile radius of you? It's 63 cents a share. It's Brian, we I've lost. You muted yourself. <laughs> we just lost that oh, one God. minute, that one past minute. Yeah, it just okay. cut out for some reason. Oh no. We can hear you now. I'm good now? Yep. All right. Well, sorry about that. I was just saying that the point is that these are very low cost cases. We, we can't hear we yeah. can't hear you now i try the headset think, one more time i think you yeah, saw I think the headphones worked yeah. yeah how about that is that any better that's better yeah i'll go headset i'll go headset uh, headset i think is dead. i think that might be the issue okay i think we're just going to go with this does that work okay mm -hmm. yeah. all right yep. there we go i'll keep it closed the bottom line is these types of assets are particularly conducive for these kind of gifts. So this is, I love this chart. 
So this actually is the Federal Reserve puts this chart out. And so they just did last year, somebody did the data visualization of the chart. And you can see this is the net worth tier, $10,000 net worth down to 1 billion net worth. Green is cash. Where do you think 85 to 88% of all the gifts in this country come from? Cash, oh my God, the smallest piece of the pie, most tax inefficient way to make a gift and so on. What's the darkest blue? Privately held business interests. You're thinking, oh, that's like publicly traded stocks. No, this is stocks, the lightest blue. They went a little bit nuts with blue here. They got 14 shades of blue, but that's publicly traded stocks. These are privately held business interests. What's the next darkest blue? Real estate. What we're seeing in mass, I will just say to you, our charity has a national donor advice fund. We only take in these types of contributions. We raised $1.18 billion last year, one year, out of my house. You can't make that up. Massive amounts of these gifts coming in. Our average donation was $4.4 million to 261 of them. And any time prior to a merger or acquisition, financing round, IPO, ESOP transaction, business succession planning, never mind all the real estate. Prior to there being a prearranged sale, being able to make a portion, that doesn't have to be the whole thing, but a portion over to your community foundation as an example, full deduction, no capital gains taxes, most always, very efficient way to make these charitable gifts. And they're much larger than otherwise they thought possible. Jen and I were talking about crypto right before everybody joined. A lot of crypto gifts until recently, but there were at least last year as an example, same thing. So. You can see the growth in this space. Our charity's grown 100% a year since 2016. That's code for doubling every single year since 2016. So a lot of gifts in that space. So a couple pieces here, life insurance and IRA gifts. We're still seeing a ton of IRA gifts coming in. Please, 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 please double check the beneficiary designations on your client's IRAs because we keep hearing from charities that they're going to the charities are getting the cash and the kids are getting the IRA. And everybody knows that's not good. I don't have to spend two minutes on that. But I think what's happening is that advisors are making those recommendations to their clients and their clients are never getting around to changing the beneficiary designations. And then they're having that sort of um, outcome. Bad is the bottom line. Life insurance. How much life insurance has been sold in the last 20 to 30 years owned by irrevocable life insurance trusts for estate liquidity? A lot. What are they doing with all this life insurance? Are they surrendering it? No. Are they giving it to charity? No. They're repurposing it to say, let's give away all of our bad assets, IRA, 401k, 403b, all to the charity, and now let's give our kids income and estate tax-free death benefit from the life insurance through the islet to replace all those assets that went over to the community foundation of these other gifts. And then in many cases, the kids are still involved with those family funds, as I mentioned prior. We're seeing a ton of that. All of that is revocable. So if estate taxes come back, which many people think they will, then they just reverse all that, change the beneficiary designations, and now they've got the life insurance for estate liquidity. But we're seeing a lot of that planning right now. Next piece are donor advised funds. You know how fast they're growing? You have no idea how fast they're growing. You can see here, actually, if you go back to 2016, there were 270,000 donor advised funds nationally, so about 1,000 donor advised fund sponsors. 274,778,73, donor advised funds now exist. These have been around since the 30s. This is not like they've been around 10 years and they're sort of hitting this growth. It is crazy how fast they're growing. You can see there are about 160 billion in assets, 48 billion new contributions. So about a third of all the assets are coming in and then a ton is being granted out. You still have some people, and this will drive me nuts if they change it. It'll drive me nuts. Do not do this uh, mandated spending policy. It'll drive, it'll, I'll go crazy. What is the spending uh, requirement for um, private foundations? 5%, 5%. So they have to go away 5%? No. They hire CPAs probably on this call today to back out the administrative expenses so they only have to give away 4.793%. That's not a joke. That's how you do it within the 990PS. 
You tell donor advised funds they can give out whatever they want. It's between a 16% payout rate is a super conservative way of calculating it up to 23.8%. It's roughly 20% is the payout rate. And you've got two just ridiculous people are focused from a Congress standpoint on potentially mandating a 5% payout requirement. Behavioral finance 101, in the first 10 minutes of behavioral finance, you learn two things. If you tell somebody they have to do something, they will spend every waking hour not wanting to do that thing. And if you tell them they can't do something, they will spend every waking hour wanting to do that thing. You can't make it up. Don't mess with this. It's called unintended consequences. Tipper Gore, Tipper Gore got that little sticker, parental warning for lyrics. Everybody remembers that stupid sticker. Years. Nobody's pro-profanity. After she got that sticker, this isn't a joke. 38% increase in sales for those CDs that had the sticker because they had a 16-year-old with a key behind the record store would have to give you access with only your parent there. So all teenagers just focused on, I got to get those CDs. This is not a joke. She was trying to have less profanity in people's hands and it went up by 38%. Unintended consequences, again. Two more slides. One, professional advisors driving the bus. This slide has not changed for 30 years. Bank of America Merrill Lynch does a uh, high net worth study, high net worth $200,000 of household income or $1 million of investable assets. And they ask them, national study, every two years, longitudinal, they'll ask them who raised the charitable question as part of the planning process. This has not changed for 30 years. Between 8 and 12% on every single survey. My advisor didn't bring it up. I had to bring it up. Drives me nuts. I've given you the exact question to raise. Many of our clients like to leave money to charity in their will. Are there any causes that you are passionate about? That's the question. But there are some advisors that love you. Some advisors, and particularly state attorneys sometimes, that will say, well, it's awkward and uncomfortable to raise this kind of question. Do you not have to raise the question of the illegitimate child from three mistresses ago as part of the financial and estate planning process? That's not weird and awkward and uncomfortable, but 99.2% of high net worth households give to charity every single year. I don't understand it. It's been 30 years. My whole goal is to move this to like 12%. Give me 12%. I'll be happy. But oh, last two slides. Disconnect between the perceptions of advisors and their own clients. I love this study, 2013 U.S. Trust Study. They interviewed the client, $10 million or more clients, biggins, two slides, two questions. They had a bunch of slides in there, but these are the best two. And they asked them specific questions. Then they asked the advisors to those clients the same questions. First one, would high net worth individuals, would you, Reduce your giving if income tax deductions were eliminated. About half the clients said, yeah, we probably would. 78% of the advisors to those same clients that are supposed to know them, have a relationship, said that they would. Estate taxes eliminated. 6% of the clients said they would reduce their giving. 40% of their advisors said that they would. And motivation for giving, reducing tax burden, half of the advisors said that was the reason why they gave, only 10% of their clients said that were true. Gets crazier. Last slide. Why don't high net worth individuals give or give more? Number one reason, this is very consistent with every study that's done. Number one reason, my gift will not be used wisely. Number one. Number two, lack of knowledge or connection to the charity. And number three, fear of increased donation requests. One, two and three. These are $10 million plus clients. They went to them, their advisors and said, you've got great relationships with them. You've helped them as part of the planning process. Why don't they give or why don't they give more? Oh, I know why. I know my clients very, very well. Number one, would not have enough money to leave heirs. That's why they don't. Or they would not be left with enough money for themselves. And finally, they don't consider himself or herself wealthy enough to give. Do you see how much of a chasm that is between the reality and the perception? And so I just encourage you as you're working with your clients, think about at least what the most of the data shows as to why they don't give to be their Sherpa through this process and partner with your community foundation to be able to help them give or give more. They're not giving for the tax reasons. 
but they're given for impact and involve the family more. So with that, I will close, and I'm about three minutes over here, two minutes over, but I hope that some of these 10 trends at least are helpful for you as we're going into year end, the types of assets to give, why people are making gifts, and most importantly, simplifying the language and having that exactly the right question to ask at the right time with your clients. So thank you very much. I guess, Jen, I'll pass it back over to you. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, very enjoyable and informative, as, as promised. Um, does anyone have any questions for Brian while we have him? All right. Um, well, thank you so much for, oh, Beth. I couldn't find my unmute button. Um, <laughs> Uh, just sorry, just a question on charitable gift annuities, Brian. Um, the uh, there's such a high threshold to get in if you're a nonprofit. Is there anything that you're aware of that um, a local charity can do to set up for donors? I also know that the pool is important, so it reduces yeah. risk by having more people into a charitable gift annuity uh, program. And so I'm just curious if you can speak to that a little bit. I can, and I'm super conflicted, but I really appreciate you asking the question. So I created, I create lots of nonprofits for uh, weird reasons. I'm the one that creates the 125 to 150 new ones a day, so I can yell at myself too. But I created a, a nonprofit called the National Gift Annuity Foundation, uh, Beth, for exactly that reason. So we're in all 50 states. We function like a community foundation, but only issue gift annuities. And then 100% of the residuum can simply be passed right back to you as an example for a scholarship fund, designated fund, unrestricted fund, don't advise anything else. But the key is you're exactly right. You have to have a pool. So we have about just under 600 gift annuities, 56 million in assets, uh, just running gift annuities because you can create loss sharing. But to your point, a lot of charities will get into it and they'll have maybe four or five or six after 10 or 12 or 15 years. And once you have a pool, you have a pool. You can't get rid of it until the last annuity passes away. So some development folks, including me, would say, oh, I think that this will be great. We'd like to add it to the menu. But then once you have four or five or six, 10, 12 years later, you have no pool. It creates all kinds of other issues, tax reporting, other kinds of stuff too. So long story short, there are groups like ours, other community foundations, some larger ones still do this a little bit. Or if it's a charity that has like a, a American Cancer Study National Office or Red Cross National Office, being able to use sort of their national or regional offices to be able to issue the gift annuities um, and then be able to give them some or all of that residuum at the end. Yes, yeah, great question. I have well, a question. Oh, Brian, I have one last question for you, just because I've been yeah. privy to your non-cash asset uh, presentation before. Can you give us some examples of some of the wildest non-cash assets that you've seen and processed? There's a lot. So, um, so the Kansas City Community Foundation received the entire Kansas City World Baseball team, the entire team. Um, I helped the transaction with charging bull number one, which is the Wall Street bull. Uh, through a donor buy fund at a community foundation. We helped with the Minnesota Vikings when they sold. We've done um, 87 truckloads of dirt for the National Mall, uh, fill dirt. We had to get a qualified appraiser to do a qualified appraisal uh, per cubic yard of dirt. Can't make that up. We currently own 37,000 acres in Belize, Panama, and Costa Rica. We own 170 acres in Uganda. I took in a $2.3 million Afghanistan farm that I was freaked out that it had poppies, but they showed me lots of pictures with wheat, so I'm hoping it was wheat. Um, we currently have a $130 million donation that is a Bermuda captive reinsurance company. We took in a very large portion, thank God we got out of quickly, of a cryptocurrency exchange in the British Virgin Islands. So it sort of gives you the gist of it's not cash. There are lots of things. We did 25,000 bushels of soybeans, oil and gas interest, timber deeds. Um, all these things are assets. 90% of what we did last year, just over a billion, were privately held business interests that were C Corp, LLCs, S Corp, a lot of S Corp, about half a billion S Corp, uh, and LP interests. So that's 90%. Another 7 or 8% were every form of real estate you can imagine. And the other 2 or 3%, frankly, are the fun things you can talk about on a plane, like cryptocurrency is 1.5%, so what everybody wants to talk about, the shiny thing, it's business interests. That, that's where all of the wealth is which we saw on that little visual. But those clients, big point, the most charitably inclined donors, if I'm where you are, if I'm in Worcester last week or Indianapolis or Jacksonville where I'm sitting today, always real estate wealth and privately held business wealth. Real estate people, what do they own? Not a trick question. 
Real estate. What do they give? Cash. Ooh. Privately held business people, what do they own? Privately held business interests. What do they give? Cash. So the point is, hopefully, after calls like this, that advisors can say, let's think about whether real estate might work or privately held business might work. This is not like I heard my cousin Bubba did one of these 37 years ago. These things are how we were doing over one a day last year. I mean, this is a, it's a machine, and we're just one. So there are multiple other groups that do this as well. So thank you for setting that up. I hope that's helpful for those of you who stay. But uh, bottom line is this, we're seeing just tons and tons of activity because it's so tax effective, and they don't view it as a direct source of their wealth. They're like, oh, my God, it was $30 million. What crazy person is going to pay $30 million? Yeah, I can take $5 million of that and park it at my community foundation, and I'll keep the other $25 million back and get a deduction against that. It's just kind of funny money at some level with these big growth gifts of real estate or privately held business interests. Well, that's excellent. Um, any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much for your time, Brian. And thank you to all of our professional advisor community for joining us today. Um, and as we said at the beginning, we are here for your questions, um, your clients' questions, and we're here to be a partner for you as you come up to year end. So we really appreciate it. Great, thanks. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. It was awesome.